Hello hackers, welcome to the continuation of the sandboxing module. I'm Jan and I'm here to talk to you about uh, SecComp, specifically how to escape SecComp. We saw a lot of um, examples of, uh, or well, two examples of how to use SecComp, one for the process itself, one for its children. Um, in the last video, today, this video rather, we're gonna talk about how to escape from SecComp. Um, typically, this is not easy. Secomp is very good. Secomp is a modern solution. I mentioned previously that uh, Docker relies on it, uh, Chrome relies on it, uh, Firefox. A lot of prize, uh, a lot of uh, serious real deal programs rely on Secomp for security. So it is very good. Um, but there is this kind of fundamental truth that all of these things that rely on Secomp for security, they need to do stuff. They need to uh, interact with the user. They need to interact with the internet. They need to uh, do things performantly, which often means calling directly into the kernel to do stuff using system calls um, rather than going through their parent process. They also need to communicate with their parent process. Typically, this means um, interacting through the kernel in some way. Um, so it's actually very hard to make a sandbox that doesn't allow any system calls, right? Typically you have something that you can do in a sandbox and this opens up um, some uh, wiggle room for an attacker. Um, we're gonna talk about three ways that uh, sand these sandboxes, seccomp based sandboxes might fail today. One of them uh, is overly permissive policies, then confusion, and the third one is kernel vulnerabilities. We'll actually cover that in a future module uh, more thoroughly. Um, let's talk about permissive policies, right? System calls are complex and there's an enormous amount of them. Uh, if you've looked at the Ryan A. Chapman system call table that I keep talking about, there are hundreds, over 300 Linux system calls on a modern Linux system and, and more are added constantly. If you pull up a modern list, I don't know how up to date Ryan A. Chapman is, but if you pull up a modern list and try some of these system calls on your computer, like the later ones in the list, you won't have them on your computer because uh, they are too new. They're constantly, you know, being added, one or two uh, Linux version um, to enable new functionality. And uh, this means that it's actually very hard to keep up with uh, sandboxing them all properly. Oftentimes you have a sandbox that might rely on some specific system call, but in one particular mode of it. So you try to sandbox um, write a sandbox, a seccomp uh, sandbox, let's say, that allows specific configurations of system calls and some things might slip through. Um, you might also just be wary of breaking your uh, programs. Something like Docker actually requires quite a lot of system calls to be enabled because everything that runs inside the Docker container uh, inherits the uh, seccomp configuration of the parent, right? So you can't just seccomp away everything um, you have to be reasonable and leave a lot of stuff open. And, and there have been Docker vulnerabilities arising from incorrect seccomp, um, overly permissive seccomp configurations. One very well-known example um, of a seccomp uh, failure case, not necessarily uh, real vulnerabilities, although there have been real vulnerabilities that have stemmed from this, is um, the uh, what happens when you allow ptrace in a sandbox process. Ptrace is uh, Linux's debugging functionality. You can use the ptrace system call to attach to a process as a debugger, to uh, monitor its execution, to change memories, change registers. You can take complete control. Obviously, if you can change registers, you can change the instruction pointer, you can inject uh, shellcode um, by changing the memory and you can execute whatever you want, right? Um, so if you let a sandbox process use ptrace, if your seccomp firewall allows ptrace, um, and that process has the permissions to connect as it attaches the debugger to another process, it can escape the sandbox through this other process. It's a, it's a fairly common um, sandbox escape uh, in the CTF world, for example. Um, uh, there are also uh, less known crazy effects of instructions, so for, of, of system calls, for example, the send message system call can send not just data that you read out of files, but the file, the open file descriptor itself. When you do an open on a, um, 
in your shellcode and it returns pod descriptor three or whatnot for the flag, typically if you send that number three to another process, it's just a number three. But using send message, you can send it wrapped in metadata that says, hey, this is a file. And then the kernel sees that metadata and transfers the concept of that open file, which is tracked by the kernel, of course, into the um, process that that you're sending the message to which it's a it's a crazy uh piece of functionality but uh it's uh exists and uh all of these examples are actually things i've used actively in ctf um uh, and it, so it exists as a as a vulnerability um there are uh crazy things that you can do with the prctl system call it's like this grab bag a weird stuff you can do to a process and then there's things like process vm write right this system call can write memory directly into another process that that you have um, some level of access to obviously you can use this potentially in the right settings to also escape sandboxes and it's hard to uh keep track of all of the functionality of, of all of these system calls um uh, securely and, and and mistakes do happen uh, let me hide my camera real quick so that you can see that whole sentence. All right, cool. Moving on. Um, whole category number two, system call confusion. Um, this stems from an interesting design decision. Um, we've talked a lot about how AMD um, made AMD64 backwards compatible with x86. You can actually run x86 code basically unchanged with very few side effects. Um, and this includes, you know, by default, all the instructions, most of the instructions still deal with 32-bit uh, code, 32-bit uh, data. It's a prefix that makes them uh, use 64-bit data and so on. Um, Linux actually supports 32-bit and 64-bit code running interchangeably in the same process. So your program might one between one line and the next or realistically you'd have to probably write this in assembly between one instruction and the next say okay that's it i'm done with 64 bit i'm, I'm moving to 32 bit mode there are actually reasons to do this um uh, there are are uh, um certain actually this enables certain other sandboxing functionality uh now obsolete uh you can look into um, native client was was the name of the sandbox um that that did some tricks with with uh, memory alignment and so forth. But uh, the point is it's possible. And, and the second point, for some reason I don't understand, let me turn off my camera again so you can see, uh, let me just move myself to the top. For some reason that I don't understand, um, uh, Linux has different system call definitions for x86, versus AMD64. There are two different ways to trigger them. On AMD64, you use the syscall instruction. On x86, you use the interrupt instruction with an argument of uh, 128 uh, in hexadecimal that is 0x80. Um, and depending on how you trigger system calls into the kernel, it uses different mappings. For example, in uh, AMD64, exit is system call 60, in uh on x86 32-bit x86 it is system call uh one let me show you this um i have <clears throat> some shell code written this calls exit that's it so i'm gonna uh assemble it assemble it into an elf here oh now we can execute this and of course it just exits we can S trace it. By the way, S trace also uses P trace to do its job. And here it is. All right, uh, we do exit. You can use the exact same thing. Like I said, 32 bit mode, no problem. We say EAX1 and then we do int OX80. Assemble it. S trace it. And there's our exit. And actually, S trace says, oh, we're running in 32 bit mode. All right. And it's that simple. Uh, what happens if you try system call 60 in uh, x86? Let's see. It is umask. See, it's not exit at all. Um, why am I saying all this? It's uh, because when you write 
seccomp policies. I mean, let's actually pull up our seccomp from the previous video. We wrote this policy to uh, add syscall, uh, uh, seccomp sys read to, uh, yeah, to add the read system call to a list of, of, of system calls that will be killed, or rather to create a rule that if it matches the read system call, it will kill the process. This will create that rule on um, for AMD64. In fact, all these default configurations for AMD64, the nice thing is the default configuration will actually kill any uh, system calls that are attempted in 32-bit mode with the int uh, OX80 uh, instruction. But there are non-default configurations that are not like that. Consider inside your Docker container, you need to be able to run 32-bit code, or at least by default, this is allowable. Um, and, uh, that's a common source of vulnerability. So if, if I add the, um, code and I forgot what this code is off the top of my head, um, but if I added code to this, in, uh, filter to allow 32 bit, uh, system calls, and I didn't specifically add a rule to kill the 32 bit, uh, version of read, it would still be allowable. And, and. Uh, these mistakes do happen and vulnerabilities do arise. All right, um, let's move onwards to kernel vulnerabilities. So this is kind of the last resort of the um, jailbreaker, uh, the sandbox escape uh, artist. Um, if the sandbox is well configured, it's very hard to escape, right? Seccomp is good. It is the modern um, good functionality. It is trusted by quite a lot of uh, companies, when used properly, it is um, uh, inescapable within its security parameters. Um, the thing is, like I said, every seccomp uh, sandbox, for the most part, has to allow some system calls because processes need to do their job. Um, and those system calls are uh, handled by the kernel, right? So the kernel receives some arguments and it starts doing work. Well, the kernel's not perfect. The kernel is actually full of bugs. All software is full of bugs. And the kernel is not an exception, right? And some of these bugs are exploitable vulnerabilities and some of them can be triggered through system calls that you can make from inside a sandbox process. Um, this is powerful. There are a lot of sandbox escapes. Sandboxing isn't the end all be all. It complicates the exploitation process. But in 2019 alone, there are like over 30 Chrome sandbox escapes. You can um, hit up that uh, GitHub link. Um, there's a really awesome list of all of them, um, not just 2019, but but uh, quite a lot. And uh, they all have, or many of them have write-ups that you can read that describe these uh, vulnerabilities and how they were exploited. And for kernel vulnerabilities themselves, of course, stay tuned. We will be covering this later in the class. Um, it is an interesting uh, area of, of vulnerability. So let's say that you uh, are, are, are not yet that advanced a hacker. You're not to the point where you're finding kernel vulnerabilities and exploiting kernel vulnerabilities. Um, what, are you out of luck? I mean, maybe not, right? Oftentimes these sandboxes, they're designed to limit uh, code execution. Uh, that's not always your goal. Uh, in fact, oftentimes your goal is to exfiltrate some data especially in all of these challenge problems. You want to exfiltrate slash flag, right, for uh, the practice problems for Pwn College. Um, if that's your goal, you might not care about running arbitrary code. You might not need to execute bin cat. You just need to get some information about the flag out. Um, and oftentimes, even if you can't get in that information directly, if the right system call is banned um, and uh, all other system calls you can think of, to write data, you can still get some information out, um, right? For example, you might be able to call sleep. And based on calling sleep, you can communicate data based on how long your process was running. Uh, I did a bad job making sure my camera doesn't get in the way here. Um, you might uh, be able to only control whether you crash or not or whether you crash or hang or, or some uh, other uh, um, one bit signal, yes or no. But hey, guess what? All data is made out of bits. If you can communicate 
one bit in one execution. In the next execution, you write an X-ray that communicates the second bit and then the third bit, and you can communicate bit by bit. Um, and there's other ways that, there, you know, every program exits with a return code if it doesn't crash, right? That is data that you are sending. Uh, you don't have to directly send data um, uh, over file descriptor or over standard out to under to get that data. Um, a real world example of kind of a roundabout way uh, that attackers um, can use to get data out of uh, networks in this case to avoid filters on outbound traffic is through uh, domain name service queries, right? Imagine I run a domain named uh, pwn.college, right? And I run a name server that allows you to resolve subdomains in pwn.college, such as csc466.pwn.college. And when I exploit you and put something on your machine, I can't get um, any queries, network queries out from there, but I can make domain name queries. This is often uh, an actual situation. In fact, um, a version of this is often used to punch through Wi-Fi paywalls. Um, I can query something like www the password that I leaked is one, two, three, four, five, six dot pwn dot college, right? And that resolve a resolution or that uh, query will go to pwn dot college. And I will see on my server a query for the password that I leaked is one, two, three, four, five, six dot pwn dot college. And now I know it. This isn't um, the data exfiltration method you should use. We actually blocked off all outbound network connections. Though this isn't the hint or anything. I'm just saying uh, the concept of uh, side channels is the general uh, term for this is a big one, a huge research area in cybersecurity. Typically, as long as you can get out one bit, then um, you have a very powerful primitive. All right, that is it for um, abusing SecComp. Uh, thank you for watching Pwn College.